Hello, I'm Stefan Trömel, Senior Disability Specialist in the International Labour Organization. And I thank very much uh, Zero Project for allowing me to be one of the keynote speakers at, the, at this 2021 um, conference. When in the ILO we speak about uh, decent work of persons with disabilities, which is our objective, we usually say that we need to have to work on three areas in parallel. On one hand, we need to have disability inclusive, confident employers, both public and private employers. We need to have, we need to ensure that people with disabilities have access to the skills that the labor market is demanding. And thirdly, we need to have an enabling environment to promote this. Now, I will look at all these, at these three elements with a particular focus on the situation in developing countries and also trying to see what has been and what is being the impact of the pandemic on this. Let me start with the first area, employers. Uh, in the ILO, we work with the private sector very much. We have an ILO, the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, which brings together both global companies as well as national business and disability networks. We also benefit from the support of a good number of large disability and development NGOs that work with the private sector. Last year, in uh, end of November, we had a conference, our annual conference. It was a virtual conference this time. And we issued a declaration reaffirming the corporate commitment to disability inclusion in times of a pandemic. We also saw uh, an increase in our membership. We had six new global companies joining our network. We saw the establishment of two new national business and disability networks in Kenya and in Nigeria. We saw very active um, uh, work within uh, existing net networks, like uh, the one in Indonesia, which was reactivated. A great example coming from India, where they came up with a publication on good practices of companies in context of the pandemic. The Chinese network con continued to be very active, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of good news within that specific um, context. I think it, it, nowadays it's fair to say that the business case for employing persons with disabilities is confirmed. Uh, it's not yet shared with everybody. But I don't think, um, but I think we have enough evidence to prove that it's good for companies to employ persons with disabilities. It's good for their innovation. It's good for their reputation. They have better products and services, better able to, to cater for the needs of consumers with disabilities and many other things, staff motivation, et cetera, et cetera. We also are not short of know-how. There are a lot of resources on different web pages, including our own ILO GBDN web page resources that can help employers to see how to engage uh, persons with disabilities, resources on workplace accommodation, on uh, how to establish an internship program, issues around uh, digital accessibility, and many other tools are already there available for employers and other organizations who want to promote the employment of persons with disabilities. We also saw, we also see very, very importantly, from an ILO perspective, an increased interest among trade unions to put the to put disability inclusion on their mainstream agenda. In particular, in the Latin American region, we have seen a lot of initiatives also, also in this year, last year, even in the current context of the pandemic, we have seen a lot of trade union interest um, to the situation of persons with disabilities and workers with disabilities. We see an increasing um, interest also among public employers, and we are in contact with uh, some partners, particular government of Canada, New York City, uh, the Irish government to see whether we can formalize that interest through the establishment of, um, of a network of public sector employers committed to persons with disabilities. We also see, and we have been supporting, and others have been supporting, that there are more and more organizations of persons with disabilities, OPDs, um, also in the developing country context, that are um, better prepared to become, not only, not only to do their advocacy work, which they've already been doing for many years, and very often very successfully, but also to engage in a more sort of partnership relationship with the private sector, which is, in my view at least, what, what, what is needed in order to, to promote the employment of persons with disabilities in the private sector. But it would apply equally to the, to the public sector. So a lot of good news uh, within that uh, sphere. Uh, we've also seen the development of other global initiatives, and I would in particular highlight two with which we have uh, engaged in close collaboration, and we, we are proud to be partners of these initiatives. We have the Valuable 500 campaign, 
which has also been um, presented uh, by its founder Caroline Casey at the Zero Project Conference. Uh, and we have also we were also very proud last year in, on the 3rd of December to support the campaign that every year is led by the Bur Purple Space uh, Initiative. Initiative that brings together the different employee resource groups that exist on disability in particular uh, among many global companies. So if you would only be looking at this, it seems that well, last year has not been a bad year, as that even in, in that very specific complicated context. But at the same time, it's fair to say that there continue to be a lot of challenges also in this context. When we speak with organizations of persons with disabilities, especially in a developing country context, but not only, they often tell us, yeah, yeah, we have seen that this, I will not give any name, but this specific company is a, is a member of the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, is also a member of Value 500. But in the work that they do in our country, they pay no interest at all, they pay no attention at all to persons with disabilities. And very often that will be the case. And we know that. We know in our interaction with global companies, they often share with us that they have a challenge. And we as an, as an ILO, we, we know how challenging it is to make sure that you're not only disability inclusive in what you do in your headquarters, but also what you do throughout your global presence. And that is, I think, the big challenge we have. We need to ensure that global companies that are committed to the employment of persons with disabilities, and there are more and more, like those that have now subscribed also to Value 500, that we can find a way to help them to make sure that they are disability inclusive throughout their global presence. And when we speak with these global companies, one thing I often like to share with them is, while it's important that they employ persons with disabilities, of course, also in developed countries, and more could be done, at the same time, when they do so in a developing country context, it's really a game change. Because the whole expectation in developing country context, very often, even among people with disabilities, is that the only opportunity lies within self-employment in the informal sector. So the moment when you see large companies opening up, employing persons with disabilities, it is really a game changer for everybody. At the same time, we continue to see also challenges when global companies very often speak about diversity and inclusion, disability features very often not at all in that context. It's about gender, it's about uh, race, it's about uh, sexual orientation, all very important, but disability very often is not even part of that diversity and inclusion agenda. And of course, when we speak more broadly about uh, the challenges in the employment space, of course, there's a huge gap still also in terms of the support that we are not able to provide adequately to small and medium enterprises. We know very often that these are the main uh, employment generators and we are not often able to support them adequately. So this is the first area in, on which I have focused uh, quite significantly because we do a lot of work with the private sector. The second area is to ensure that persons with disabilities have the skills that the labor market is demanding. And that of course means education, it means uh, university, it means uh, vocational training, and we see that there are still many barriers in that context. Uh, when we just focus for a moment on, on the need for digital skills, which seems to be one of the key messages now um, that also was already there in all the discussions around the future of work, but especially now the pandemic has accelerated the need for everybody to have digital skills, and that of course also applies to persons with disabilities, who as you know often will start with, uh, with, with, a, with a disadvantage because of the digital gap that they were often, often facing. I will not um, speak too much about this issue because just yesterday, also within this conference, we launched a publication on the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the digital economy. And we highlighted the different areas that require work, digital skills, ensuring that people with disabilities have access to digital skills is a key element of that publication. And many of the recommendations we're doing there would also be relevant more generally when we look at other skills. Think, for instance, about uh, climate change jobs, which are also hopefully on the rise. We, again, to ensure that people with disabilities get their fair share of these new jobs, we need to ensure that they have access to the different skills um, initiatives that are there in those areas. The third element, as you will remember, is the enabling environment. And I think the pandemic there has shown something we already knew, but I think it has put even more visible the shortcomings that we still have in this specific area. We often have not enough, good enough legislation, often perhaps referring to reasonable, reasonable accommodation, but not explaining how that is implemented in practice. We have very often social protection that is not that is clearly insufficient 
for the needs of persons with disabilities and their extra costs, but also very often designed in a way that it, not, it does not promote uh, employment. We have insufficient um, job placement, job mediation services. We have now seen some digital platforms that have been, have been established targeting persons with disabilities, good initiatives, but definitely not enough. Very often we don't have a good statistics, although we know how to um, obtain dis uh, disability disregulated statistics, but we are often not doing them. So we have seen it also in the current context, often countries that have been collecting information statistics on the impact of COVID-19, disability has not featured. So we have not been able to obtain the, the statistics on the impact of person on persons with disabilities of the pandemic. Our key message from the ILO has been from the outset of the pandemic, and it continues to be a relevant and important message that disability inclusion needs to be part and parcel of the mainstream response to the socioeconomic impact that the crisis is having. And we feel that this is not yet dealt uh, with in, in an adequate and sufficient way. Now, so our, our key message, my key message also at now the end of my keynote speech is really, it's a message to all of us. We all need to make sure that this building back better commitment that is coming from, um, from, from the UN and from other stakeholders, this building back better needs to be disability inclusive. As the Director General from the ILO said um, very, very clearly and very well in a video that we launched um, last year, a disability inclusive response to the crisis is a better response to all. Thank you very much again for having me and all the best to you all. Goodbye. Thank you, Stefan. Um, it's hard not to be clapping and waving. Um, I want to bring uh, Yetna Besh in to have a conversation, just a few questions um, before we go to Vlad, who's joined us. Vladimir Kurt, hi, Vlad. Um, but before we do that, I want to bring Yetna Besh in because I think, Stefan, something you said really kind of captures that the employment of people with disabilities in the developing world is the game changer. I mean, you said that twice. That's where we can see see real system change. And so I think there's nobody better to speak to than Yetna Besh, who has lived experience, who is from Ethiopia, who is a lawyer, who is one of the founders of Light for the World uh, Women's Awards, who is senior manager for GLAAD. And I just have to say, Yetna Besh, before you speak, I remember meeting you at the Inclusion Summit, was it in Bangalore? and hearing you speak and you just blew me away um and i think you just have such a myriad of experience to bring to this conversation so do you agree with stefan that that the game changer is the employment in the developing countries and what is happening and is it changing thank you carolyn and uh, it's, it's really great to hear to uh, stefan speaking on this uh, fantastic points. Yes, I do agree with the points raised. In particular, I want to give you an example saying that um, uh, in many cases in developing countries, even a person with a disability gets called by his or her name once he or she is employed. Until then, we share the generic name of the blind, the physically disabled, the deaf, whatever, whatever. And um, it's really important to emphasize on two points, uh, actually three from Stefan's point. The first thing is that making sure that global level commitments cascade down to the grassroots level lives. I fully agree with Stefan that companies like IBM, Coca-Cola, whatsoever, whosoever, or the 500 that you have in the valuable 500, may commit to remain inclusive globally. But what really matters is, are they really inclusive on the grassroots? Do they employ people in Kenya, people in Zambia, people in Ethiopia? So sometimes global level commitments are stuck there. Second thing is, of course, the disconnect between the demand and the supply. We in the Global Action on Disability GLAD Network always get a request to pass on advertisements, uh, vacancy announcements to persons with disabilities. And we see employers struggling to get the right suiting candidate to the disability. It does not mean that they're not there, but there is a disconnect and it's important to fill the gap by uh, facilitating or by bridging the gap and bringing in together, filling in the demand and connecting it with the supply. They are there, but there is a huge disconnect. So it's important to work in bridging that gap and making sure that the demand and supply meet in, in between. Last point I want to talk about is on the skills. 
I do believe that, and I want to uh, say, say this strongly, it's equally important to think about reasonable accommodation and other adjustments throughout the training, not only in employment. Now, sometimes the focus has become on employment, and employment does not come without skills, as Stefan has nicely highlighted. I want to share with you a very tragic story which happened in Ethiopia just a month ago. A law school student who is blind and have finished his education had to sit for an exit exam. He sat for that exam four times and failed. This year was his fifth year that he was supposed to be uh, sitting for the fifth time and take this exit exam in order to be employed. Unfortunately, he came late, 30 minutes late to the exit exam, and the guard in the exam center prohibited him from entering. Just six hours later, that blind young boy committed suicide because that was his fifth time that he cannot enter into the job market because of that lack of reasonable accommodation due to the time adjustment. So I think I should say that, and I believe and share with Stefan that reasonable accommodation and skills training is equally important as we do it in the employment. I believe the pandemic has showed us a number of lessons. And I would say that, of course, it has brought an opportunity, but there are also a lot of challenges that we need to keep on working despite all those amazing stories of the Global Business Disability Network and of ILO and of Valuable 500. Over to you, my dear. Um, okay, I, I, I just need to come back to, to something that you said at the beginning and then relating it to the story that you've just told. So if you, if I understood what you said is that a person with a disability doesn't get called by their name until they're seen as valued, valuable by business and job. So it's the blind girl, not Yetnabesh. Is that, is that what you're saying? So that identity, that personal identity isn't given value until they get into employment or recognize their value by business. And so I want to make this connection to employment and understanding. So in the developed world, we're starting to un see the employment connecting to the value of the market and the value of the innovation that this our community brings. Are, is, there, is that happening in your country, in Ethiopia? Are we seeing that in the developing world, that the employment of people with disabilities is being attached to the value of the market and to the innovation that we bring connecting to serving the market? Is that something that's happening? Or is it being done because it has to be done or it's a worthy or a good thing to do? Yes, it's, 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 I would say it's in progress uh, because um, most of the time we see it, people or companies employ because they feel that it's their obligation. Mm -hmm. But we also have witnessed in some companies, like for example, in flower companies, where they kind of say that, yeah, you know, we have this benefit from hiring persons with disabilities. But I would still say that the value card is not yet fully placed and is not yet uh, 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 to, uh, used to the fullest potential. It's nowadays companies feel maybe it's their obligation and, you know, sometimes they get convinced. But I would say that there is a huge potential and importance in terms of especially the how train. Now people are convinced as to why we have to be um, employed. But still, you know, because it's our right and we have to work and we have to gain money and things like that. But I would think we are not yet strong enough in most of the developing countries in showing them how much they are losing out and in showing them how much value that they can add into their business if they employ us. So it's a work in progress. And Stefan, can I just come to you? Um, you were talking about, I mean, the, this, that disability has often been on the sidelines and has never had as much focus, investment and intention. And just to back up your, your argument, um, in 2020, 3% of the articles discussing corporate diversity and inclusion mentioned disability. 3%. Like that's 2020, i.e. last year. Um, why do you think, I mean, you've been in this a long time. What do you think is going to change that? And do you see that changing? And what is the barrier to remove to make that happen? Yeah, no, not, not an easy one. I mean, you probably have, no. you have, better, you have a better answer to that question. No, I don't. Than myself, no. I mean, I, I think I'm positive. I think we need to, we need to be positive, especially also in, in the current circumstances. 
And I'm, I must admit, I'm two days in the week, I'm optimistic, and two days I'm pessimistic. Yeah. And the fifth one, I'm sort of in between. No? <laughs> it, is, it is difficult. No? But at the same time, I mean, if, if I see the, the number of companies that have joined the Value 500, even in 2020, such a complicated year, the increase in membership that we have in, had in, in, in GBDN, the, the new networks that we were able to, to help launching uh, last year in, in Kenya and Nigeria, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, mean, I, was, I remember I was listening in to the, to the launch of the Kenyan network, which was hosted by the Federation of Kenyan Employees. I mean, the, the mainstream, the, the tough employers in Kenya, and before the, the, the network was launched, there was a discussion and the head of the Federation was basically saying that the crisis had um, increased this uh, focus on, yeah, of course we need to have profit, we need to have benefits, but it's been much more focused on people than before. No? Now, I don't think that that is happening throughout the board, but I, I, I see more, and it's a leadership issue, and, and we, have, we have made that quite clear. To, remember the webinar we organized jointly uh, last year? Mm -hmm. we, the message we will try to convey is it depends on the leaders of organizations, private sector, public sector, UN entities. It's really the leaders that will, that will, make it, that will, that will influence whether an organization comes out of the crisis in a diverse and inclusive and disability inclusive as part of that way, or whether sometimes they will go back to to old ways of thinking because uh, they might think, look, uh, diversity and inclusion or disability inclusion is like a it's a nice thing to do, but it's a nice thing to do when 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 the when the when the, when the, when the things are rosy, but in the current complicated time, it's not there. I'm seeing more and more organisations that that are convinced that this is this test needs to be passed, and that they need to do much better on diversity and inclusion. So I think. I, I remain opt optimistic about that, but um, but still a long way to go. I have to say, I from our perspective, we would see too. I think it's the world can't unknow what it knows now. Like we do know, in the year of 2020, the business system did flex when it had the intention and the will to do so, and that was witnessed. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to ensure we don't go back and we hold a mirror to what can happen and the, for me it's about who really cares to make this happen very much so um i think what we're going to do is bring uh, vlad in to, to have his keynote with us and then we i'd love us when we come back to, to have a conversation just to talk about what this collective action looks like what collaboration looks like so that we uh, as we build back in into this new world how we do that uh, multi-stakeholder and trying to balance the individual needs against the co uh, or with the collective. So, Vlad, I, we're delighted to have you join us for your keynote. You, um, as everybody knows, you are the executive director of the International Disability Alliance. You, like both Yazi and uh, Stefan, have many years uh, committed to the space, 19, I believe. Um, you're also the co-chair of GLAD. Um, you are also very uh, wonderfully also the partner of the Value Book 500. And I know you and I were co-conspiring only two days ago on, uh, on how we can make sure the world remains open and positive and we change it as we move forward. So we're delighted to have you for your keynote. Um, and so over to you. Good morning. My name is Vladimir Chuk, and I am executive director of the International Disability Alliance. It is my greatest pleasure to present today on inclusive employment and ICTs. Globally, there is a growing focus on inclusive employment for persons with disabilities, and this conference speaks in that favor. For example, at the Global Disability Summit in 2018, there were 97 commitments on, on economic empowerment. Thanks to this growing focus and donor, donor interest, the discourse on inclusive employment is moving from, uh, from only looking at why to include persons with disabilities to now discuss how to frame inclusive practices and remove systematic barriers so that inclusion is achieved in the true sense of its term. Available data from before COVID-19 pandemic shows that persons with disabilities face significant exclusion from the formal labor market and are more likely to be in the informal sector. Simultaneously, lower rates of employment have been persistently observed for persons with disabilities. 
It is now 14 years since the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was adopted, and five since, since the Agenda 2030, with Goal 8 focusing on full and productive employment and decent work for all. Speaking ab about ICTs, accessibility is one of the CRPD principles as well as a, a, a prior prioritized in the CRPD article number nine. While the CRPD committee in its general comment number two on, on accessibility and international cooperation clearly articulates the need of using international cooperation as a tool to promote accessibility for all. Along with the government obligations established under the CRPD convention, Agenda 2030 presents connection between accessible ICT and its goals, in particular, goal nine on, on, on industry innovation and infrastructure. It is a good time to review today the successes we have achieved and the gaps in terms of fulfilling SDG 8 in line with Article 27 of CRPD. IDA's experience in working on inclusive employment particularly shows that there is, there is, uh, there is urgent need to clarify between inclusive employment and CRPD compliant inclusive employment. We believe that in inclusive em employment focuses on getting people with disability into jobs, while CRPD compliant inclusive employment would require us to take a more holistic approach to transform labor markets uh, leading to the removal of barriers to employment and fundamentally shifting the way that businesses conduct recruitment, support their employees and create inclusive environment for all people with disabilities. Uh, uh, International Di uh, Disability Alliance work on employment is trying to frame CRPD compliant approaches and ensure that persons with disabilities and their representative organizations are integral part of all efforts to create inclusive workplaces. We have noticed that there is still very limited understanding of the principles of the CRPD and how they translate into formal labor markets. Concepts such as universal design and reasonable accommodation, non-discrimination, etc., are still not embraced. It is important to understand that employment for persons with disabilities does not happen in isolation. It is intrinsically linked to education, accessibility and the availability of laws and policies that protect the right of persons with disabilities to access opportunities on an equal basis with others. The need to put CRPD at the core of how we look at the employment and accessibility for persons with disabilities holds even more significance now that the world continues to grapple with the, with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The sudden lockdown and the downturn in the global economy have even greater ramifications for persons with disabilities, particularly as they faced significant exclusions and barriers even before pandemic hit. People with disabilities already were less likely to be employment. Now, they are, they are also at a greater risk of losing their jobs. The Disability Rights Monitor on COVID-19, a survey undertaken by six organizations, including IDA, indicated a worrying conclusion that states have overwhelmingly failed to take sufficient measures to protect the rights of persons with disabilities in their responses to the pandemic. International study implemented by ADD on the impact of COVID-19 shows that uh, respondents reported losing 65% of their income since the COVID-19 crisis began. Similarly, another study by European Disability Forum shows that in, in Kenya, 68% uh, of persons with disabilities surveyed were not able to work. The pandemic has, had also, has also led to a stronger focus on the use of technology in employment, um, amongst in many other things. Information and communication technologies are rapidly modifying the way people interact, work, travel, and communicate both at home and in their communities. While technology has been a game changer, in many cases, it, it also stands to deepen existing inequalities in terms of availability, affordability, and accessibility to online platform and assistive technology. In our experience, uh, we, we, we have shown how certain groups, such as people who have deaf blindness are finding it harder uh, to access online activities. 
More generally, with or without pandemic, persons with disabilities are facing enormous gaps in accessing technology. Let me list a few of them here. Lack of awareness and training on assistive technology. Absence of policies that provide access to accessible ICT. Excessive cost of assistive devices, especially in the Global South. Lack of universally designed ICT tools. And important for, for this conversation, uh, those that are, uh, um, um, among other things, pre pre preventing persons with disabilities from accessing to financial services as a way of getting uh, themselves out of poverty. Universal design standards as well as guidance on accessible ICT are yet very limited and rarely present in policies and programs. Even within this adversity, we do have an opportunity to start an open discussion on some of the fundamental shifts needed to realize the right to decent work for all and create truly diverse workplace and accessible societies. If we want to build back a truly inclusive workplace, reflecting the diversity within the disability movement and intersectionality with other kinds, kinds of margin, marginalization as well, we need to embed the principle of non-discrimination across all our work, create support services and social protection measures that enable people to not just access jobs, but also retain them, invest in strengthening the disability movement and organizations of persons with disabilities, so they are at the center of this transformation and disability inclusive transition. Mm -hmm. And finally, a few additional co uh, recommendations about access accessible technologies. International standards must incorporate accessible features and be implemented and licensed to all organizations. Promote universal design approach to policymakers, developers, urban planners, etc. Ensure meaningful participation once again of persons with disabilities and their representative, representative organizations. And, and last recommendation, invest in emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, smart environments, etc. International Disability Alliance is open for discussions on inclusive employment and accessibility, and not just within the disability movement, but also with, with, with other development partners, especially today on how to build back better after the pandemic. If anything positive that we can learn from, from this crisis is that this crisis taught us that we are living in a world that is deeply interconnected and no one will be safe and included until we are all safe and included. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Vlad. Um, before I ask the questions that I want to ask, um, Sumita, can I just ask, have there been any questions that you want me to bring to the panelists from the chat or will I continue on ahead? Uh, yes, we do have one question. Thank you. Um, the question is, yesterday, Professor Stein mentioned employment quotas as a measure which has had a positive impact in Brazil. In Europe, quotas are sometimes regarded as problematic. Are quotas tools which are widely used in the global south and are they having a positive impact on balance? Okay, I'm going to now put that question. Uh, Yeti, um, do you have an opinion on quotas and targets? Um, I think uh, we need to carefully analyze this question. So I, I should share a story that we, we missed out in Ethiopia. We all thought that quota was a charity model. Can I confirm that you're hearing me? Perfectly. Thank you. So we thought that uh, quota was a charity model. So we advocated for a merit-based employment and we uh, managed to abolish the quota system in Ethiopia. But uh, I, I do understand, especially thinking back uh, nearly uh, 14 years back, um, I really see that we were wrong and uh, learning from a number of experiences in Chile, also here in Kenya, as well as in Nigeria, we have seen that quota works very well as long as it's managed very well. So um, there are countries, quite a couple of countries in the global south, I don't have the exact data, that are implementing quotas, uh, but uh, they are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Quotas need to be 
uh, supplemented with other measures ensuring equality and ensuring diversity. So in some instances, just people take to fill up the quota quite low positions and only some group of persons with disabilities, but they're not inclusive. So I would say that quotas are important and necessary, but they're not sufficient and they need to be complemented. But there are countries both in Africa as well as in Latin America where quotas have played a significant role in terms of increasing the number of employees with disabilities in the labor market. Thanks, Yeti. You know, I, I'm kind of on, I'm there. I used to be completely against quotas and targets, and I think I'm really starting to, to change my perspective as well on that. Um, Steph and Vlad, what, where are you both on, on this issue about targets and quota? Yeah, if I can come in, uh, Caroline. I mean, um, I fully agree with what Yeti has said. Um, I, I, can I can see the, the negative uh, um, uh, implications of, of quotas. But uh, all in all, um, I think uh, quotas can make a contribution, especially also in the developing country context, where sometimes if you don't have a quota, you, you can't even engage with the employers, public or private, on this discussion. Now, what we see in, in most countries is very badly designed quotas, either with no enforcement mechanism at all, or with an enforcement mechanism that establishes such a high fine for non-compliance that companies decide to put people with disabilities on their payroll but ask them to stay at home. And we've seen that in a number of countries in, in different regions. No? So I fully agree with Yeti. It's about, a quota can help. I would definitely not argue against the quota, uh, but it needs to be complemented with other measures. No? Other measures that make it easier for, for employers and persons with disabilities to find each other, as we've already uh, discussed before. Um, the, the vocational training system needs to deliver, the public employment service where they exist need to deliver. We need to have NGOs sometimes filling that gap and ensuring that there is a good match so that uh, persons with disabilities are getting decent jobs, as we call them in the ILO, and not just sort of only entry positions where they will enter and stay in the same position for the next 20, 25 years. That is not, um, that, that is not what we are trying to, to achieve. No? But I would definitely not argue against quotas, but they need to be well designed and need to be complemented with other measures. You know, um there was, a, there was a piece of research that was done, I think it was it, is it in 2016 or 17, that said 50% of the companies operating in OECD countries chose to pay fines instead of fulfill quotas. I mean, wow. Um, Vlad, you know, where are you fitting on, on the, the idea of targets and quotas? Are you in the same ballpark, sort of? Similarly, similarly. To, to what was discussed, I, I I don't need to really repeat what was said. I would just say that um, it is uh, it is it is important to talk uh, to talk about um, really 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 inclusion uh, of all persons with disabilities in the in the labor market. And quota system, what we learned from from some some countries when they work, it worked for for just. Um, uh, some groups of people with disabilities. So uh, basic, uh, basically employers are trying to hire somebody just to feel, uh, fulfill the quota or they find uh, uh, some uh, disabled people to really work. That's true, it can happen. But uh, we didn't see that it is really inclusive ac uh, across all types of disabilities. So I would, not, I would definitely not argue against because it's a one, one step we need a really holistic, systematic approach to resolve this uh, uh, this issue. It's, uh, this is one tool, but it, it it cannot be that governments decide to like to like implement this tool and that's it. No, we need transportation services, we need personal assistance, support services, uh, interpreter services provided in order to, uh, for people to uh, uh, to apply for jobs and then to basically sustain jobs. So it is somewhere in between supportive, but not solution for all, yeah. There's a, the, one of the things that we are hearing from the Valuable 500 community um, is the lack of uh, compelling research and data. I mean, I don't think any of us can argue with that. Like we do not have, there's huge gaps um, and we haven't even had a really big global piece of research done for how many years um, on, on disability. 
within one of the things that the companies say to us that is a barrier around the employment piece they use as i will say as an explanation i'm going to say excuse is because of legislation they can't ask us to declare or identify of having a disability and this is is something that they're using as a reason um saying that it's complicated mm -hmm. does anybody have an opinion around this issue around legislation uh, identifying as being a barrier for companies to employ people with disabilities. Does anybody have an opinion around that? Because it is something the companies are speaking to. Or have I, I asked? Yes, Jeff, and go first. Well, I mean, uh, well, yes, the, it, it is an issue. It's an issue, especially um, if you if you look at it from a from the perspective of a global company. It is very difficult to uh, come up with a harmonised approach throughout their global presence because you will be operating both in countries where you have a quota legislation and where it is legitimate to ask your candidates if they have a disability, they will probably have a disability certificate or a card, because if they are employing them, they will then be able to count that employment against their quota obligation. Now, if that same company works in a context where um, where you have anti-discrimination legislation but no quota obligation, in many contexts um, that you people might, will, you, you are not allowed even to ask mm -hmm. from a confidentiality and privacy point of view whether a person has a disability. You should be asking whether a person requires a reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. And you can, if you communicate well, and that is our recommendation, if you communicate well and explain why you're asking it, you can, in a staff survey, ask uh, the, the respondents to self-identify as a person with disability. But you do explain it well. It's not you being nosy and trying to find out what sort of condition the person has, but you can explain that you as a company want to see whether you are doing better over time. And the only way of doing that, or one of the best ways of doing that, is to see whether the number of staff with disabilities um, are, are is increasing. And, and that would require, in such a context, would require self-identification. So it is complex, but um, I would say it's it's it's... It's, it's not impossible, no? And, um, and I also wanted to go back to your issue about the research. I mean, yes, research is always good, but I still think that we have enough knowledge. I mean, we've never had so much knowledge from companies that are already employing persons with disabilities on, on why they're doing it and, 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 and how they're doing it. No? So I think uh, if, if, if other companies come in and say, we need more research, I would say, well, why don't you speak with your peers and learn from them? No? And, and going back to what Yeti said before, we have a lot of global companies which are struggling to um, be consistent on disability inclusion throughout their global presence. And, and it's challenging, but I think we, we need to work together with them to um, not only to hold them accountable, sometimes yes, but also to support them so that they're not only doing a good job in the US or in the UK or, or in Spain, but also in Ethiopia, also in Madagascar, also in Egypt, also in, in Brazil. No? I think we have, we have the the tools to do that, but I think we need to engage uh, in that uh, much more proactively. Thank you. I want to come back to you on that because I think that is it's probably the most important issue that what we're looking for is our companies to have the intention and the values and the commitment to getting this right, but their expression of it will not be uniform across the globe. Another piece of feedback our companies are, are, are saying is, okay, their, their greatest thing is we're not doing enough, so dot, 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 we won't do any more. So that fear of not getting it right and not doing enough and not having a uniform solution is nearly stopping the organizations from investing in it more. What Yeti or Vlad, what would you say to that? Or Stefan, are, are you hearing that as well? Because I would have to say it is the one common thread. No, we need to get our house in order. And I feel like saying, but when are you going to get your house in order? You know what I mean? Like how much longer? And how do we support and help them move beyond the fear that they're going to get cancelled out or hammered for not getting it right? Because that fear of not doing enough is a barrier. Do any of you have a, a sense of that? I think you're right. And 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 if I can connect this with your previous statement that you said that companies are like finding excuses, I think that there is many things about this. I think that still uh, disability, I mean, the last uh, fr uh, frontier where we need to succeed in a mainstreaming disability will be in uh, uh, in the global market. So we, we need to really find a way how to bring people to work. 
really. And this is still not happening across the world. So, so I think that, that some major shift is needed, some major understanding that, okay, we cannot do it perfectly. There is so many messiness in this business and we need to welcome and, and embrace this, uh, this messiness, but we have to go ahead and, and try doing it. If we, if we look at the research, like Stefan says, if we look at this, if we, if we uh, try to explore what will be the best in terms of water or not water, just go ahead and do it. And then by doing it, we will learn how, how, how best this can, this can be done. Some people are genuinely not doing this because they, they don't want to make mistakes. And somebody are just, it's easier to say, oh, we don't have this perfectly. We don't have training in like human resources. We did not develop our uh, uh, portfolio in this. We don't have that and that. We, do, we don't have specialists. So we are going to wait until perfect mm -hmm. moment comes. Pe uh, people with disabilities cannot wait anymore. And to be honest with you, world cannot wait anymore. We are, we are excluded 1 billion people with different talents uh, just be, because of this uh, state in uh, uh, in which we are. But also, I, I believe that we need to, again, look at this holistically, that, they, that, this, this, that companies and private sector just can go, can do as much. I think that um, we cannot put entire burden and expectations that the private sector will sort it out themselves, everything. I think that there, there should be support systems from the government, uh, that will uh, encourage and support workers with disabilities to um, to to sustain jobs, especially. You see, I think the issue with innovation, by its nature, is innovation has a lot of failure attached to it, right? And there's nobody who's an expert in all of this. And so, through the in innovation, we see failure. But through the the failure, we see insight. I mean, this is where we get. The, the solutions and the models. And I think we need to create a an environment, to Stefan's point, that is supportive of the failure because that's how because at least that's trying. Do you know what I mean? Rather than just kind of turning uh, turning away from it because it's too complicated. Now I I have we have a few more minutes left and I'm gonna ask the same question of, of the three of you. You both of all three of you are leaders and you've all been in this space a long time. Um and I'm not going to ask you a personal question um, because I think anybody listening here wants to hear what you personally feel. Like you've been doing this a long time. Can you just say to tell me the disability community traditionally ha would have been seen as not being as collaborative as we could, or maybe there was more space for this collective collaboration moving forward. We've heard words like intersectionality and interdependency and interconnectedness. Yeah. Can I ask each of you um, an end on the positive one? What is your greatest frustration or barrier? And then what is your greatest hope in the next year for that collective collaboration and building back better? Because end on the positive, but also let's call out what's frustrating you or the thing that you'd like to see get rid of. So um, Yeti, I'm going to ask you to give us your, 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 the frustration and then end on the positive uh, of what your hope is for. Okay, no, thank you, Caroline. I think uh, you put me on the spot. Well, my, my greatest frustration in this in this regard is that we always keep on getting uh, excuses or explanations for what you name it when it comes into employing persons with disabilities because I, I think still it's not viewed from a value uh, angle. It's not viewed from a loss of asset angle. So I still keep on listening the same excuses from time to time for not employing persons with disabilities. And as Vladimir said, now the, the problem is real. It's really, really coming real and becoming real that persons with disabilities need to get employed. So I think my, my greatest frustration is that the companies and the employers still lack the lens of the value. My uh, greatest hope, actually, I'm not a big fan of building back better, okay. even though I, I we, we use it quite so often, but I am, I am very optimistic and building forward better. Why do we build back? We have to build forward. Uh, and I can have it for discussion, Stefan and Vlad, if you, if you would wish to continue after the session too. So we need to build forward because the future of work, where we, which we were really thinking about would come after 10 years or after maybe you know a decade or so, is already here. Who anticipated that my small bedroom would turn into an office 
and that I have been working from last April onwards, not seeing Vladimir or any of my colleagues in India, Canada, but we have an excellent coordination. So the future of work where the digital offices, where the digital world, as Vlad said, of course, with all its in existing inequalities and divides, has already come and I would hope that that would bring and open a new opportunity for those of us who encounter a number of barriers on our way to the office, on our way back from the office to the house. So I see that the future of work is going to be more inclusive and we have got enough of discrimination and prejudice in the past. So I see that the future is bright for inclusion and it's possible and COVID was a test that it's again possible. Thank you. You see, that's why you are such art art articulate. You're like a poet. Well, well reframed. Uh, Vlad, your, um, your frustration and your building forward hope. Thank you very much. Uh, I have many, many frustrations, I have to say, uh, uh, from, this, uh, from this period and not just from this period. I think that, that uh, uh, first of all, uh, I have frustration with the fact that we are, as a, as a collective, we are satisfied and, and we are celebrating uh, sm small achievements. It is generally a nice thing to do. Uh, it is generally a nice thing to do, to be happy with little. That's what like, people say. But I really think that uh, we are uniquely uh, uh, made in that way framed in that way, if you like, as a community, that we are very happy, we, we satisfy if, uh, if somebody commits like $1 million for like, uh, uh, disability inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. I think that we need to start uh, shaking the system a little bit. I think that we need to, we need to ask for more and we should stop celebrating everything and, uh, and just simply uh, to to be uh, to request to be part of a solution and to be part of solution and to insert ourselves there. So looking forward, and um, uh, I I I am in the first place uh, looking for for this pandemic to to finish, but I feel that it will be far away. So we are looking at a lot of uh, a lot of issues be uh, before that. We uh, we we have to fight for vaccinations. Uh, uh, not just in a global north, but in a country that still did not receive any vaccines. So we need to really uh, work on that. And yes, there is a there is a lot of optimism there. And uh, but I, I feel that it's just a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and uh, yes, and I I call for m maybe more collectivism in this too, that we all join forces from 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 different perspectives. I think indeed that there are some nuances, some new approaches. And this is what I feel is really motivational. So, uh, Caroline, this is not that I'm like uh, like sucking up to you or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, I really feel that, that like organizations su uh, such as yours um, and many others, and maybe some newcomers to like global disability movements such as Paralympic uh, Games and, uh, you know, which existed for a long time, but not inside the disability rights movement. They're bringing some new, fresh set of ideas and new approaches okay. and, mm -hmm. and connecting, connecting, connecting different parts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vlad. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, the connecting co collective collaboration part. Um, Stefan, the last word is going to go to you. What's your frustration and what's your building forward better? Look on, on the building forward. I fully endorse what what Vladimir said. I think we we, we are we are able to uh, to increase uh, and become more blunt. I think we, I think we're on a good track, but we need to we need to improve much more.